method, but so the path is not unique. So now we have a way of actually getting to our optimum by just changing the base, the uh, bases for the column space of A, I, our augmented matrix, and that's all that we're doing in order to move along the vertices of this domain and find our optimal solution. And then we compute the function every time. And, and it, oh, and the way you determine if you stop, I should have said that, the way you determine if you stop is if there are no uh, positive values, obviously, in your R vector, in your relative cost vector. So if we go back, if the relative cost vector was negative 80, negative 10, stop the algorithm. There's no, there's no improvement that can be made. Because, um, well, because, yeah, you're gonna add, you're gonna add R times the variable Xn to your objective function, so. so that is what that is how the simplex algorithm works. The next part uh, that I want to talk about is duality, and this is von Neumann's contribution. So if we look at p from our example, we uh, we can see that if we multiply the first, second, and third equations on the left hand side there by by certain non-negative numbers, we can actually get back our objective function. But we're going to get back a little bit more than that. We're going to get back the objective function bounded by this linear function of those three variables. So for example, if we choose uh, 200 over 7, 30 over 7, and 0, then we get back our objective function bounded on the right hand side by 3000 over 7. So this is, um, so we found an upper bound for our function. This is what is called the dual problem. So, and if you, if you just look closely, you can realize that it's basically the transpose, the negative transpose of the primal problem. Um, and what you do is you minimize, you want to minimize this upper bound on f subject to these constraints where these are the coefficients of the original function. Um, and these are, this is the transpose of this matrix here. So this is the dual, this is what's called the dual of the, of the uh, original problem. And what are the relationships? So, the first relationship is basically what I just said. It's called the weak duality theorem. And that is, in, for a primal problem, and it's dual, uh, the, fu the objective function for the primal will always be bounded by the objective function for the dual from above. Um, well, I guess it depends. Uh, you, can, you can, depending on the problem you're trying to solve, if maybe if you're trying to minimize, uh, then you would maximize the dual, so, but this is, uh, we just want to think one way right now. Um, so, now, now I want to ask the question for what I call a feasible pair, x and y, which is a, which is a, a pair that will satisfy the constraints here, y, and uh, x will satisfy the constraints here. How small can we make that distance between f of x and g of y? g of y is the upper bound on f of x, and we want to minimize that function to see how close we can get, how, how small can we make the upper bound, but is there a gap? That's the question. So a little visualization here. You have the primal space, you have the dual space, and they're both mapping to R1. And f of x is always bounded by g of y. But at the optimum, x star, y star, the optimum for the p space and the optimum for the dual space, um, is there a gap, what I, what's called the duality gap? And that is answered in what's called the strong duality theorem. If either p or d has a finite optimal value, so if, if neither of the regions are unbounded, then you can optimize your objective function for, for P and your objective function for D, and there will be no gap. They will equal each other at that point. In that situation where you have a, a bounded region in both the primal and dual space. So there's four ways. The, the first way, which is what I just mentioned, which is really the case that you want to look at because it's the only one that's interesting. Um, and, the, and then you have the possibility of this, uh, the primal space being unbounded. Now it just, just to think back a little bit, if I was running the simplex algorithm, um, and I, if I had drawn this a little better as a, as a kind of a polytope type region, uh, you would run along the vertices of this, and then you would get to a point where you're trying to improve a variable, and you realize that you can keep increasing the variable, and you don't have to stop. So the simplex algorithm would also determine that the, function, the, uh, the problem would be unbounded at that point. So if the primal problem is unbounded, then obviously you can't make an upper bound on the problem. So if, <laughs> The dual problem has no uh, has an empty feasible region. Similarly, if the dual problem is unbounded, has no lower bound, then there's no uh, there's no feasible region for the primal space. 
and then you have another wacky scenario where you have both uh, are empty, and they say there's an infinite gap here. But I don't really care about those. I just wanted to mention them. We really want the one that we really care about is this, um, where they're both bounded convex um, regions. So, with that, if we have an optimum for the primal problem, and we have an optimum for the dual problem, then we have what's called complementarity slackness. And that's basically just, you have this, uh, you have this property from the strong duality theorem, and that uh, solving, uh, moving everything over on one of the equations, you get one, and on the other you get two. And we have this kind of inner product relationship happening here. Either the variable, the coordinate in the, uh, the point in the dual space, has to have value zero, or the equation, the inequality in the, I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly, the, the, uh, the coordinate in the primal space has to have value zero, or the inequality in the dual problem has to have value zero. That inner product always has to be zero. And similarly, the dual, a dual point, the coordinate has to be zero, or the primal uh, inequality has to be zero. So let's look at an example to see what I'm talking about. These are very ugly problems, but I like them because they're real world problems and, they, and there's actually, they get kind of cool when you, when you zoom out a little bit. So we have the primal problem here, and we have this dual problem here. I'm not going to do the simplex algorithm for this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something else. I'm going to say, let's, let's pick a point that's feasible for the primal problem. Zero, four thirds, two thirds, five thirds, and zero. And let's say, okay, if it's feasible, we have a theorem that says it has to satisfy these conditions. So, I'm um, sorry, not, if it's optimal, we have, to, we have a theorem that says it has to satisfy those conditions. So let's check if it satisfies. So if we plug in, we realize that this is indeed feasible. Um, it satisfies equations one through four in the, in the primal problem. And here we have um, the third inequality in the primal problem is non-zero. So this is not zero. Forcing the third coordinate in our dual space to be zero. Um, another thing is, is that um, these three coordinates are non-zero. So from condition one, we know that uh, that these uh, three uh, these three inequalities, qualities uh, seven, eight, and nine, I believe, or yeah, seven, eight, and nine have to be. Uh, oh, there they are. Yeah, seven, eight, nine. They have uh, inequalities seven, eight, nine have to be equality, so that that inner product will be zero. So, um, so we have this. So we put it all together, and we have um, seven, eight, and nine, with uh, y y prime three equals zero. We get this system, and we get an alleged optimum for the dual one one zero one. If we plug that in and try to uh, evaluate that in a dual feasible region, we realize that we we don't satisfy uh, the ninth equation, or the ninth inequality. So this is not an optimum. So what just happened? Well, you have the primal problem, and you have the dual problem. And at the optimum, they have to be equal. So you have this, again, this inner product here. The xi is, is equal to 0, or c transpose y transpose a sub i is 0. And similarly in the, in the, uh, in the uh, property 2. So if I just clump everything together in a, in a big vector, um, the, the, the left hand side of that will be z and the right hand side will be w and I have the inner product between these two vectors has to be zero in order to be to, to have an optimum so uh, again we, we were forcing the third coordinate in the dual space to be zero by the fact that we um, we did not have uh, equality in the equation three in the primal space so we're talking about the linear complementarity problem here so uh, we finally got to it. So we, uh, we call our, our, our vector w uh, the vector of those, of those two uh, inequalities. The inequalities for the primal and the inequalities for the dual. z is the coordinates for the uh, primal and dual. And the inner product always has to be 0. So we, we, this is a specific case of the linear complementarity problem, where uh, m is that matrix, zeros, zeros on the diagonal. So now, with the linear complementarity problem, we have no objective function. All the information is contained in the matrix M and the vector Q. 
And that's really what you want to look at at this point when you're dealing with a problem. You want to look at the form of the matrix M and see, okay, what properties does it have? Is it tridiagonal? Is it, um, uh, is it a what's called P matrix? So if we, uh, for an example of, of how the linear complementarity problem works, we just, we just need to find W and Z satisfying the conditions. So we have the, we have the matrix 2, 1, 1, 2, and negative 5, negative 6. So um, I just rewrote this equation up here, uh, down here, this way. So that's the same, the same equation, I just wrote it a different way. And um, I, need to, I need to find vector, uh, vectors w and z satisfying this while their inner products are only zero and their component wise greater than or equal to zero. So let's try something. Let's, say, let's set w equal to zero. And that leaves us with just uh, this part here. Okay, so what do I get out of this? I get what's called a complementarity cone. And this is all the non-negative combinations of the vectors negative 2, negative 1, negative 1, negative 2. Um, and if there is a solution to your linear complementarity problem, it has to lie in some complementarity cone. And in this case, uh, we happen to pick the right one. And there's our solution for Q, or there's our vector Q. The vector Q has to lie somewhere in that cone. <clears throat> Depending on the matrix M, if there's any linear dependence, for example, in your matrix M, you may, you may have less or more or overlapping uh, complementarity cones. And so it is possible for a Q to not appear at all in any cone. So if you take every possible complementarity cone, they call that KM. That is the union of all the, all the uh, complementarity cones. In this case, it's just uh, all of R2. So there was a, there, somewhere there was a solution, no, no matter what in this case. So what we care about is the matrix M. And we want to know some properties. For example, maybe it's a, a positive semi-definite matrix where the uh, Z transpose MZ has to be greater than or equal to zero component-wise. Maybe it's positive definite, um, which has to be strictly greater than zero. Uh, if, I, if I have what's called a P matrix, first I have to define what a principal submatrix is. Um, if I have a, a square matrix F, <coughs> and I delete a certain row of F, I have to delete the corresponding column. So if I choose, for example, sub F1, I deleted the first row of F, that means I have to delete the first column of F, and I get sub F1. Sub F1, 3. I deleted the first row, the first column, the third row, and the third column of F, and I get sub F1, 3. It's always the square matrix that you get back. And it's, so the indices that you choose to delete for the columns have to be the same indices you choose to delete for the rows. This is not a principal submatrix. Um, I deleted the first row and the second column. Yeah. The first row and the second column. So this is not a principal submatrix. A P matrix is a is a F would be a P matrix if the determinant of all of its principal submatrices are strictly positive. And these have a nice property. That that means that you will have a unique uh, solution to your linear complementarity problem. So uh, again, we care about the the matrix M. And, and the form of it. it uh, if we take the, the next step up, I guess, would be a quadratic program. And you have a, a quadratic function. And the matrix D is your uh, quadratic form. And if the matrix D is positive definite, then you know that you're going to have a global minimum for your problem. So, uh, you know, there's theorems and that's yeah, I have to go through a few theorems to prove that, but that's, that's the idea. Is that the ma the, really what you care about is the form of the matrix M. So here's some papers that I've, I've looked at. Um, journal, uh, Dr. Huang sent me this one on uh, journal bearings. Whoops. Um, so a journal bearing is I can find the diagram. It's uh, it's 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 basically when you have a uh, uh, a bearing contained in a cylinder, and there's a layer of fluid uh, in between. Um, okay, well I don't know where the diagram is, but 
yeah, you have a layer of fluid in between, and he wants to describe the physics of, of what's going on there. So in order to do that, he has to solve uh, the linear complementarity problem, and uh, in order to approximate a solution. Um, this is a contact dynamic simulations. I have to look more at that more at that one, but again, they they uh, they run into the same situation. They want to um, find a numerical solution to something, and they and they run into the linear complementarity problem. Uh, this one is on options pricing, and if you've taken a class called partial differential equations, this is the Black-Scholes equation, and we know how to solve that just by some very tedious transformations. You you uh, bring that down to the, the heat equation, right? As, yeah, bring that down to the heat equation. And you end up with the, uh, the problem that you want to solve here, 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D. Um, your domain is all of R right now, but that's not very helpful, so you, you, you find a bounded domain X sub bar, X bar, and in order to find a numerical solution to this, you, you, you split that up into M plus one sub intervals. And this is called the finite element method. And um, so in each interval, you, you define a function phi sub h i. And um, that will be 0 everywhere at every other node and um, non-zero at, the, no at the, uh, the ith node. And so this is kind of a basis for this function space. And these are your coefficients. And they, um, so they do all this numerical work to uh, get the numerical approximation to u sub h. But now to compute it, so they, they end up shoving everything into, uh, you know, this, these are the coefficients of, of uh, the phi h i's there. And then your phi h i's are in your matrix M. And um, they get back a statement of the linear complementarity problem. And then they use a method called the successive over relaxation method. And uh, it's from what I understand, it's, a, it's just a fast computational way of uh, solving a system of linear equations. So, um, so applications are everywhere. Um, now, some open problems in the, uh, related to the linear complementarity problem. What is the computational complexity of a linear complementarity problem associated with, P, associated with a P matrix? So as I stated before, a P matrix is uh, a matrix that all the principal subdeterminants are uh, positive. So in this problem, we saw that 2, 1, 1, 2, our matrix, has kind of trivially all principal subdeterminants positive. And it has a unique solution. And that's the nice property of, of a P matrix, is that uh, you will have a, a unique solution to your linear complementary problem. But bizarrely enough, there is no efficient algorithm for computing the solution when your matrix uh, M is a P matrix. There's no polynomially bounded algorithm for computing your solution. So that's one open problem. Another one is the classification of the square matrix. You want to figure out what type of matrix it is. And if it's a positive semi-definite or positive definite, for example, uh, there's, there's efficient algorithms for computing it, uh, for, for determining that. But if it's a, a P or a P naught matrix or Q, um, Q matrix, what is the um, I'm sorry, I can't recall the definition of Q matrix at the moment, but uh, you, you don't have a way of, um, you don't, there are no efficient algorithms to determine, okay, it's in this class of matrices, P or P naught. Um, so that's an open problem. Another one is to say, okay, let's say it's not a P matrix, or let's say that there are multiple solutions to your linear complementarity problem. These algorithms, what they do is they'll, they'll run through your space, and then when they find a solution, they, they stop. And if there's multiple solutions, they, the, the algorithms do not continue, for the most part. There are algorithms which will determine every solution, these full enumeration methods, which, which actually go through and compute everything, but that's not efficient. So there are, uh, they want to find a, an efficient algorithm, basically a polynomial bounded algorithm, um, that will um, that will determine every solution to a, a linear complementary problem that has multiple solutions. Now polynomial time, I mean, I'm assuming everybody knows what it is, but, uh, but just to go into it, it's, it's you know, you, you, if you have a function, uh, if you want to determine how long it takes to, to run through your code or your, uh, your computation, 
if as you increase the number of steps, if, uh, if, if that cannot be bounded by a polynomial time, then it's not a polynomial time algorithm. And the simplex algorithm is not a polynomial time algorithm. There's two guys named uh, Klee and Minty um, who they come, I don't, I don't have this in the slides, I just wanted to indulge, but they, uh, they, they came up with um, what's called a, a cube or a, a D cube. They have several examples. One of them is a D cube. And um, so let's say you're in three space. Can I draw a cube? Okay. <laughs> um, and basically, if you start here, uh, and this was a long proof on the lecture that I saw. It took, it took like 45 minutes. But basically, you can realize you, you'll go through every possible vertex of this cube before you arrive at the optimum. How many, how many vertices are there in a cube of, uh, in, in, in n cubed, there's two to the n. So I believe, I'm sorry, two to, yeah, so you have to do two to the n minus one iterations of the algorithm. Um, and, if, and if you can imagine, every time you have to compute an inverse, an inverse just in undergraduate linear algebra is a pain to compute, that takes a lot of computational time. So at every vertex, I'm computing an inverse of this matrix and more. And so this, uh, this uh, is a, exponentially growing algorithm and not efficient. So the simplex algorithm is interesting because on average it's, uh, it's the best algorithm out there. Uh, they do these experiments where they will, uh, they'll, they'll test all these different um, algorithms uh, on different problems with you know, hundreds of thousands of variables and thousands of variables and they'll find the simplex algorithm on average is the best. Now when you get up into higher variables uh, say millions of variables. Uh, there's a, there's another algorithm called Karma Kar's algorithm, which is a polynomial time algorithm, and uh, is better on that order of variables. Um, so there are better algorithms when you get very high. But on an average, the simplex algorithm uh, for most real world problems is still used. There was a problem in the 90s that you had. Um, well, it, I mean, still to this day, airline companies are using linear programming to find the best way to schedule their their flights because apparently, some time back, they were allowing planes to fly off, uh, you know, partially empty, and they weren't making the most uh, out of each out of each flight. So, so that's that's it. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so. <clears throat>